Uh, are we good to go? Is everyone here? Okay. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to our University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice uh, Advanced Standing Social Work AM Admissions Overview. Um, very glad to be here today. This is actually our first advanced standing uh, specific webinar that we've held. Uh, I am Ron Martin, uh, he, him, his, and I'm the Director of Admissions. Uh, I'd like to introduce a few of our team members who will also be joining us for today's webinar. Um, Jamal Banks, our Assistant Director of Admissions, and Emma Toomey, our Admissions Specialist from the Field Education Team, Mel LaMagna, the Director of Field Education, and then um, Melissa Williams, who is one of our Field Coordinators, also uh, to be joining us uh, will be Kristen Reed Solomon, our Dean of Students, uh, Diversity and Inclusion. So just starting off, I uh, just wanted to definitely mention that this is the Advanced Standing Program webinar. And so this is specifically for students who do have a BSW degree from a CSW accredited institution. So if you do not have that BSW or comparable social work program from an accredited uh, CSW accredited program, then I would definitely invite you to intend instead one of our uh, social work um, webinars in which we talk more about the uh, both the full-time and the part-time social work programs. And a lot of the information is going to be the same, but this will have some information that is much more specific to our advanced standing students. And so here's our agenda um, for the next hour or so. So we'll take a look at the institution. We'll take a look, um, we'll go through a curriculum. We'll talk about research and field placement, student development, and then we'll close out with the application requirements, deadlines, and a little bit about finance of the cost of the program and financial assistance. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, also know that please feel free to add questions into the chat. We have team members who will be responding to those questions. Um, and then we'll, we can stop at different points along the way to see if there are any questions that we can sort of answer out loud as we move along. So a little bit about the Crown Family School. Um, we are originally the School of Social Service Administration. We are one of the first schools of social work in the country. We opened in 1908 and we affiliated with the institution, the University of Chicago in 1920. Uh, the Advanced Standing Program, it's, it's somewhat new. Um, it was approved in 2017 and we had our first, coming, uh, first class come in, uh, join us in 2018. Um, so, uh, for those of you here uh, listening into the recording, uh, potentially you could be joining our seventh cohort. Uh, in 2021, uh, we had a, uh, a name-changing gift from the Crown Family, and that's when it became the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. And we are pleased to share that we are one of the top schools of social work uh, per U.S. News and World Report. So I mentioned a little bit about our programs. So today we're going to be focusing on our master's uh, arts program in social work, social policy, and social administration. And why might one do this degree? What, what, what's the point of doing this social work, this program, right? And so this is for students who are um, our students. They pursue careers and assume leadership roles in diverse areas across a range of social sectors. And that can include child and family welfare, health and mental health, advocacy. Um, it can also include education, criminal justice, um, violence prevention. And these areas, they cross uh, individual family community management and policy levels, both domestically and globally. Um, it also provides training equivalent to an MSW. Now, we're not going to talk about these two programs, but I did want to mention that we do have a master's degree in social sector leadership and nonprofit management. This program is geared for uh, students who have been working within the nonprofit and social sector realm for about three to five years who are looking to enhance their leadership skills. Um, think about org theory and the way that organizations work, both externally and internally. And we also have a doctoral program. It's really focused on research. Um, and it's meant to be sort of like a faculty or researcher preparation program. So what is social work? A very common question. What, what does social work mean? Um, here we have this quote from uh, the National Association of Social Workers. The primary mission of the social work profession is to enhance human well-being and help meet basic and complex needs of all people with a particular focus on those who are vulnerable, oppressed, and living in poverty. 
And what does that mean for us in Crown? What I often share is that, you know, what we're doing here is we're considering how individuals, families, and communities are impacted by systems and structures of privilege and oppression, and then the institutions and policies that shape them. And what we're doing here in Crown is we're using research and data um, to partner with populations and with organizations to affect positive change through um, direct practice and through policy creation. I think what we're also doing is we are helping students sort of consider, um, you know, interrogate their own identities, their own sort of biases, their own um, marginalizations, um, to really consider like how do those things play out? How do how do identities, how do experiences play out and inform how students go about doing? Um, you know, the, the, the practice of social work. Um, so both there's this element of um, you know, critical thinking that goes along with the education um, and thinking about how we're working with populations. And then we often think about social work in sort of three different levels here that I have outlined. So the micro level, um, that's more direct practice, working with individuals, um, some possible careers, thinking about counseling or casework. Um, at the meso level, working with groups, um, in organizations, so thinking about community organizing, working with local organizations. And then we have the macro level um, area of practice. That's usually the high level. So that's the social administration part, thinking about um, policy, advocacy, and administration. Um, a little bit before we get into curriculum, just a little bit about the program, about the setup. So here are some of our student demographics. You see that we have a wide range of students coming from around the country, um, as well as internationally coming to our program. Uh, average age of the entire master's group is 25, although that does trend maybe a little lower um, for those in advanced standing who are coming directly out of their undergraduate experience. But you'll see that we have a whole age range um, that you know this past year um, range from 20 um, all the way up to 56. So there's definitely a, a wide scope of people coming into our program. And then a little bit about our academic year. Um, you know, what does it look like? When are you here? When are you in classes? And so University of Chicago Crown, we use the quarter system. And so for this advanced standing program, um, students start in the summer. So uh, this coming year, well, this past year, it was in June 12th. Um, so we start mid-June. Uh, we have the fall quarter, winter quarter, and then students will finish up in our spring quarter. And then what does that look like on a weekly basis? Um, so here you'll see our class times. So we have three different blocks of classes. Uh, typically our advanced standing students uh, coming in, um, they've already completed core through their BSW program. Um, so our students are then sort of coming in as second year students. They're taking classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the field placement schedule, that could be um, typically it's two, sometimes three days a week. So Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, student would be uh, completing their field placement hours. And then a little bit about the advanced standing program. Um, so I mentioned um, this is for students who have a BSW from a CSW accredited institution and within the past five years. Now there's a little sort of leeway. Sometimes we have students maybe six or seven years out, but typically um, the advanced standing program is for those who are within five years. It's a, a one year program. So I mentioned, you know, the four quarters and that's 12 classes. So it'd be three classes per quarter over the four quarters. We have that one uh, field placement. Um, and it's our only program that has a summer uh, June start intake. Um, and we are typically looking to bring in a cohort of about 25 to 30 students. So a little note about our curriculum. We're pretty excited about this. So we are going to be moving towards a more integrated curriculum. And so what that means is in past years, um, we've always been asking students, do you want to focus on, uh, on uh, direct practice um, the clinical aspect, or do you want to be focused on social admin, sort of the macro side? Um, and I think what has been happening over the years is really we have had much more of an integrated model where our students are exposed to both direct practice and to the social admin sides. 
um, we're always sort of considering how does direct practice impact or influence policy? How does policy then impact direct practice? And so I think that our curriculum is now starting to reflect what we've been doing in practice for a very long time. Um, so we are moving to that model. Um, the faculty approved this new model back in May. And so we've been working through the summer to sort of like, you know, outline what that actually means for the students. And what we'll be announcing soon are some pathways for study um, that students can participate in. So definitely as time goes on, we'll be sending out a lot more information, a lot more announcements about these pathways as they are, are finalized. Um, you'll see down here. So what will the student get out of this? And I'm just going to read this here. It offers students a comprehensive skill set, focuses on intercultural awareness, and emphasizes a deep understanding of the policies and social structures that impact social work and social welfare practice. And so what are some of the key curriculum ca characteristics that we have here? Um, you know, students will be focused on thinking about the foundational social work theories and concepts. Um, and I'd mentioned uh, research and data, so definitely using research evidence-based practice, um, thinking about human diversity. Um, we all have, we all hold a number of identities. And I think, you know, for our students to think about, you know, what are the identities of populations for themselves but and the populations with whom they might be working with? Um, you know, no one holds one singular identity. So also thinking about the intersectionality of, of individuals. Um, so really thinking about the human diversity, how we're connecting people to resources, how people are experiencing resources, um, thinking about policies, it all comes into play. And those are a lot of conversations that we're having in the program. Um, I would mentioned the three levels. Um, and also here at this box, uh, multidisciplinary perspective. One of the really interesting sort of great fun things about the program is while most of our faculty are going to have an MSW, they're going to be teaching clinical classes. Um, many of our faculty are coming from a doctoral programs, so their academic experience is far beyond social work. We have faculty who are prepared in, in sociology, in economics, policy, political science. And so what that means for the students is you're taking classes with faculty who have lenses and framing um, outside of the realm of social work. And it becomes a much more expansive sort of notion of what social work is, what social work can be. And then thinking about the types of careers that um, you might pursue after. A few other key curriculum characteristics. We talked about you know, the macro level and the micro level, social policy, direct practice, um, human behavior and social environment. There's a, a course requirement thinking about um, what people are experiencing over their lifetime. Um, thinking about ethical dilemmas and decision making, I think that we're always questioning, you know, as we're thinking about direct practice and thinking about policy creation, are we are we affecting positive change, you know, and so thinking about the limitations, um, and maybe some of the frustrations, but also the opportunities um, to really, again, go about to affect positive change. And then, uh, as mentioned, it's not simply an academic program. Um, we also have this practical experience with the field education. Some of the nice things, so um, we have plenty of electives for students to take. Um, here are a couple of sample um, courses that students might take, but what's also really great is that our students are able to take classes throughout the University of Chicago graduate divisions. Um, here we have five of the schools where we often see students take classes, business, public policy, law school, uh, social sciences, and divinity. And so what that means is if there's an area of study or a content area that you'd like to pursue more, and maybe we don't have the class that is sort of filling that need for you, if there's another graduate division at the university that does have that type of class, that you're able to take it um, and to sort of, you know, fill out your, your educational experience. Um, at this point, let me pause and ask, are there any questions in the chat that we could answer? No, no questions in the chat. Fantastic. All right, great. Okay. Now, a critical component of a graduate degree, and definitely the degree at Crown, is this idea of research. Um, research happens at all different levels. Um, when you're in a graduate program, oftentimes, like what you're doing within the classroom is you're doing research, you're looking up sources, you're thinking critically about what those sources are, you're writing papers, you're providing your, you know, your, um, are offering sort of um, studies or like I say, um, research projects. 
um, it's all tied to the idea of research. It's, it's just really, it's a hallmark of Crown of the University of Chicago um, and definitely is something that you find typically at the graduate level. Um, here are some of the, the skills, the learning skills that um, come as a part of um, doing research, you know, thinking about qualitative uh, interviews, um, coding and content analysis, uh, quantitative data collection, data analysis, lit reviews, um, drafting reports, um, or even, you know, transcribing audio video recordings. And how do students become involved with research? As I mentioned, research is a part of the academic, the classroom experience. But um, oftentimes um, we'll have research assistantships available. Um, so students can then work directly with a faculty member. Um, oftentimes those we sort of learn about those research assistantships sort of later in the summer. So while there's a summer start, there's always an opportunity to join uh, or to, to receive like a, a research assistantship potentially um, for the sort of the, the autumn, uh, winter and spring uh, academic quarters. Um, we also have um, for funding the, the university's office of research administration and we do have a number of institutes and research centers that our students have worked in um, so here we have a list of a couple of different ones like crime lab and shape and hall and our different centers for policy okay so now i would like to invite uh, melissa i think you said you were going to take the lead here melissa and mel to talk a little bit about field placement Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Williams. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the field coordinator at Crown. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself again. Sure. My name is Mel Lamagna. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the director of field education. Thank you so much all for joining us here today. I'm happy to be here to talk to you all about field placement and what that looks like at Crown. As you all may already know, field work is an essential component of your experience at Crown. During field, you'll have an opportunity to apply theories and techniques that you are learning in the classroom into the field. Your placement process will look different depending on the student type and um, what you are planning to study. Uh, but for advanced standing students specifically, you all will be completing an advanced standing placement um, when you do come to Crown. Um, when you get accepted and accept your offer to Crown, you will immediately be connected to somebody in the field education office, and we will be meeting with you one-on-one -on -one to discuss all of the resources that we have available to our students. Uh, we have an agency database that we will introduce you to, and on that database, you will see that we have over 600 plus agency partners um, that are interested and eager to host Crown students. Um, through that process, you will do your research and select the agencies that you're interested in um, applying to that align with your interests, with your goals, and that will be able to provide you that experience to prepare you for your future career. Um, through that, then you will then apply directly to our agency partners and interview um, directly with our agency partners. Um, in our other resources that we have available are those different um, trainings that we will provide our students. We will have other tools that will prepare you um, for that interview process as well. As I stated, we have over 600 plus agency partners. If one of those don't align with your interests directly, we also welcome our students to let us know if they wanna choose their own adventures, what we call it. So we are always happy to connect with agency partners that we may not have a partnership with yet and onboard them as long as they can meet the requirements to host our Crown students. But like I said, you will be connected with the field education office as soon as you accept your offer and we will assist you throughout the field placement process. Um, outside of the field education office team, you will also have a field consultant that will support you throughout your field placement um, at Crown as well. But for your field placement, let's see, like I said, students will choose an interview for the position based on their careers and goals. And then your field placement, depending on your um, track that you choose, you will either be in placement two to three days a week. Anything else, Mel, that you would like to add that I didn't address? It sounds like you covered it all, Melissa. But just to reiterate, field education is such an integral part of your education here at Crown. And the support and resources that we provide that Melissa was mentioning are really designed 
um, for you to be able to curate the type of experiment experience you want uh, throughout the year. You know, you have the one field placement for the year. And so the support that we're going to provide is being able to exhaust all the possibilities, as you can see, that we cover the wide gamut, wide map of uh, the types of agencies ranging from clinical work that could be direct practice and it could be therapy to policy work, where it's um, doing a lot of the research and creating policies and grant writing around social service issues. So um, a lot of the gamut that we cover covers so many of the neighborhoods that are here, uh, particularly here in the South Side in Hyde Park, where we partner with a lot of agencies and community partners to build um, these relationships and opportunities for you to consider. When you fold in uh, the one-on-one -on -one work that we do that Melissa was talking about is going to talk about what your interests and your goals are so that we can map you appropriately to, to these locations and then be able to um, have the interview skills, have the uh, resume and cover letter building skills that are specific to um, interning at a placement. Uh, so what we do is provide a lot of workshops and a lot of information around how to prepare for these um, interviews and uh, try to create the best experience we can for you um, for all through a one year that you have um, with the program. But other than that, I think that's all I have to add. Great. Thank you to both. And and I definitely want to sort of reemphasize a point that, that both said, you know, while the students are, you you know, you would be looking for your own placement, um, students are never alone in the process. Um, so we have this tremendous field education team that is there to support students through the way, um, sort of to, to address needs, uh, to hear concerns, you know, but to really support students through this, um, through this process um, and through their field placement. Um, unfortunately, our, our student, our advanced standing student was unable to join us uh, today. But I did want to maybe share, um, I had a conversation with one of our recent graduates about her field placement experience. Um, and she was placed with uh, Chicago Public Schools um, with the administrative offices. And, you know, what her experience is, I think, you know, and I don't know if Melissa and, and Mel have anything to add to this, but I think what her experience was is um, what so many students are able to experience is you're working with an agency, you're working in some sort of organization, and you really get to see sort of like all the aspirations and all the limitations of each and every organization which you're working. You get to see sort of the best of what is desired to do, of uh, the best way to affect positive change, and then some of the just the very real world limitations of what it means to work in an organization, whether it's, uh, you know, issues with, um, you know, staffing or resources, financial, you know, so you really come to see it's a, it's a great experience to sort of have an understanding, like when you go out into the world, not every experience is going to be like every, every experience has the potential for being just great opportunities opportunity, but there's also the learning aspect of what the limitations of, a, of, a, of an organization can be. Yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's a great example from the student in terms of being able to be part of an organization or community organization um, that are dealing with real issues and can impact on many levels from direct practice to creating policy around it. And I think our students have that unique lens when they come to Crown as we're talking about the integrated curriculum, uh, this ability to apply what you're learning in the classroom into the into the field practice allows you to be able to work across all these multiple levels pretty seamlessly. And I think that's the beauty of this program. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to your example, again, Ron, to the student's example, I think what also sets us a little bit apart from other, um, other schools is that the way that we uh, vet and partner with agencies far extends from what may be typical to social work. So if we're thinking about case management and direct practice, clinical work and some of the policy work, we're also looking to impact other industries, whether it's in business corporations or even the creative arts. And so we really see a large range of the types of opportunities available to our students because we garner a lot of interest from um, agencies and community partners who see the benefits of having the social work lens applied to their programming. And I think that's what um, really makes the field experience pretty exciting. And also like you said, a great learning experience all around. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, our, our um, previous director of um, career development would often mention in his conversations with um, field placement supervisors, um, that they really liked our students. And there are any number of programs out there that will 
can really train a student, you know, as well as ours about, you know, the what or how to do social work. But what they really liked about the Crown students was this sort of fundamental understanding of why. Why do systems and structures exist as they do? Why is this work important? Why are we doing the work that we do? Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that as well. Okay, so student development. Um, so I would like to now invite our Dean of, of Students, Diversity and Inclusion, Kristen Reed Solomon, to talk a little bit about um, student development. Hey, thank you, Ron. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Very, or you know, I guess it depends on where you are, whether it's evening or not. <laughs> um, but thank you um, so much for being here. We're excited that you're interested in Crown and interested in our advanced standing program. Um, so as Ron said, my name is Kristen Reed Solomon. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm Dean of Students, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I get the awesome job of working with our Dean of Students office um, every day um, and supporting students in our program. Um, so um, just a quick overview, our office, um, uh, manages admissions, uh, career and leadership development, um, academic support, and all sorts of other operations, pretty much all of the things that happen outside of the classroom while you're a student um, at Crown. Um, our office supports students throughout the full life cycle. So I mentioned admissions and all the way through to graduation and beyond. Um, and we really support our school's mission. We support the work that you do, you're doing. Um, and we really believe in a student's first philosophy. Um, so we're here to make sure um, that you feel supported from the moment that you accept your offer um, to this program to, um, um, to graduation and beyond. So um, a couple of things about what we um, uh, provide um, and general support. So um, uh, the biggest support that we provide is academic advising. Um, our academic support really um, encompasses all of the ways that we directly and indirectly support your curricular experience. So that includes transition initiatives like orientation and graduation. So on the way in and on the way out. Uh, but it also includes um, academic advising. So we'll do individual and or group advising sessions with students so that you know what are the classes that you need to take to get you to graduation? What are the courses that you might need for a particular certificate program? Or if you're wanting to focus in something specific or what class could substitute for a different class? We would be um, your team to go to for those specific questions. And of course, if students need to take a leave of absence, change from full-time to part-time for whatever reason, um, that would be something that you would work out with the advising team within the Dean of Students Office. Um, we also um, have a really robust leadership development um, area within our office. So we support students thinking through their leadership, your identities, how you can develop your skills, um, both personally and professionally outside of the classroom. So we host workshops, community building events. Um, we have student organizations. We have a very active student government association um, that hosts events and really provides advocacy and support um, to the student body. Um, but we really believe in our students being engaged and really you know, feeling that sense of belonging. And that starts with just being involved in what's going on um, within this, uh, the building and within the university um, at large. So we help to support and sponsor um, various student organizations um, as well. Um, and then, yeah, we do lots of events. Um, we think it's important you're you're doing lots of hard work, really important work um, in class and in the community while you're at field. So it's important to have space where um, you can experience joy, you can rest because rest is resistance, right? Um, and and just ways for you to build community. This is your your new family, you know, if you will. And so um, for our students here, we want you to get to know each other because when you get out um, into your careers, into the field, these are the folks you're going to call on. These are the folks who are going to be in similar roles across the city or across the country um, who you might need at some point. So you, you're going to want to get to know them. So we like to provide spaces and opportunities where you can do that too. All right, so yeah, all the things that are happening around Crown, we do lots of things, as we mentioned, and this is just some, some photos of some of our, um, our events. Uh, but one thing I'll call out is our Washington Week. Um, we really do have a robust career and leadership development area, and Washington Week is one of the experiential um, opportunities that that office provides. Um, we take students during spring break to meet with um, alums, policy leaders, folks working in nonprofit, government, uh, you know, social service agencies um, in D.C. Um, to you know, shadow to do informational interviews. Um, we did a tour of the White House, so we get a little fun, but we also get to learn and students make really good connections for potential jobs, you know, after they graduate. Um, so that's just one of the many things we do. We host employers, we have um, 
all sorts of info sessions, alums who do panels. So um, of course, you know, career development, we know that's part of the reason why you're coming. Um, one of the main reasons why you're coming. So we make sure um, that we've got a lot of robust programming in that area. But yeah, we've got speakers, we do fun things. Um, we have, have so many different programs and events um, for our students to really, again, um, be all a part of the, um, the community. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely like to share, you know, when you're thinking about our program, when you're thinking about any graduate program, you know, but we have all this programming and I think it's important to sort of express like when you're doing a graduate program, it's not simply a one year academic experience, right? So there's the field placement component. So you have this experiential as aspect of it, but then you also have all these supports um, in programming to help sort of round out the experience. So you have this sort of like holistic approach to your your whole development and then what it means to be doing. And, and you know, as you say, there's there's professional development, there's social development, it's, it's, it's academic, professional, social. It, it really brings all aspects of the self together. And I think that's what really makes a great experience. I just, I know from my own graduate experience, like I was so focused on the academics and my program at the time, it, it offered nothing. I mean, we sort of created our own social groups, but the university I went to in my, my particular programs, um, both for my master's and my doctoral level, two different institutions, they really offered very, very little in, in scope of programming. And so I'm always struck by how much we do be with presentations, um, speakers coming in, panels. There's just a lot of opportunity to grow and learn um, and to just, again, just have a very different type of experience than what other programs or some other programs might offer. Absolutely. All right, so, okay. And so here are um, some of the outcomes we were talking about career and leadership development. So here are, here, it's just a, a brief list of when we've done surveys of our graduates, you know, what areas are they in? So obviously there's social, um, you know, organizations working in the you know, city, state or federal government or, or agencies, organizations. Um, you can see healthcare options. You'll see education, higher education sort of options. Um, some students are going into more individual practice. Um, so there's just a whole scope of different careers. And again, going back to this idea of, of a diverse um, social sector, um, you know, social services, a diverse range of social services in which our students are participating. And, and again, just like I say, it's, it's very expansive what you can do with a social work degree. It, it's really not simply just meeting with clients. There's, a, there's a, so much more that we do that social work, you know, happens with social work and what the Crown Family School will help prepare students to do. So now I'm going to shift a little bit about, um, so coming towards the end of our slides, by talking about the application requirements. So obviously there's an online application. Um, we'd want to receive your transcripts. Um, so during the application process, we're happy to receive a copy of the transcript um, post admission. Um, we would then ask for the final official transcript showing the degree conferred. Um, that would be sent directly by to us by the institution um, online or paper version. Um, we have we asked for the comprehensive resume candidate statement. Um, both would be um, uploaded into your application prior to submission. Um, just a note about the candidate statement. We have our statement prompts. They're on our website. Um, and just as a, a note of, you know, maybe a tip or so, you know, someone was shared with me what they told their students, and I've often repeated this over the years, um, you know, candidate statement, it's probably, you know, the first thing that you start and the last thing you finish. Um, and, and the reason for that is it, it's really sort of one of the best ways for you to really represent yourself to the program. It, it's the way that you can show how you know, the program would benefit you um, and how you might benefit from the program, you know, or benefit the program by by joining our community. Um, so it's just really something to, to think about. Um, and then three letters of recommendation. Um, for those of you, many of you coming directly out of undergrad, um, we are asking for two academic references. Um, they do not, they definitely do not have to be in social work. Um, they don't have to be from your social work program. What you're really thinking about are which faculty members do you have connections with who can really speak to both your academic ability and or um, any sort of research project or research um, uh, experience that you've had. Um, so, so those are the types of, of letters that we're looking for. Now you'll see in this list, there is one thing definitely missing. 
Um, and that would be the application fee. So we're very excited that uh, this year we are waiving the application fee, typically $75. We're waiving the application fee for all our master's programs this year. And then um, following up on our deadline. So we have two deadlines for the advanced standing program, uh, December 1st, so it's coming up in about a month. Um, and then we will we'll be releasing decisions sort of on a rolling basis. So as the reviews are completed, we'll be sending out the decision letter. Decision letters will also include any scholarship information within them. And we hope to have all, uh, all decisions for those submitted by December 1st, by February 15th. And then our second deadline is January 15th. So just shortly after the, the holiday season, um, and again, releasing decisions on a rolling basis, and we hope to have all decisions out by March 15th. Um, the reason they're so early, again, is because of the summer start and to help students sort of make that informed decision whether or not they want, want to attend. And then once they've made that decision that they can start the field placement process. And so the application is now open. So you definitely don't need to wait until December 1st to submit your application. You can submit at any time. Um, but um, December 1st is that first deadline. Actually, because it's on a Saturday, we will be um, considering all applications submitted through that Monday for the first round. And then what is the cost? Um, you know, what's tuition and fees? So um, the tuition is uh, 66, uh, 312. So all our social work programs are billed at the same um, per course rate. Um, so it's a little less for those in the full-time program per year, but this is going to be four quarters. So it's one year. So this is actually the full tuition cost of the program. Um, this is also the full cost for all the different fees. So the student services fee, uh, the one-time lifetime transcript fee, uh, the, the UPASS, which you can opt out of. So the UPASS, um, for those of you who are not in Chicago or might be unfamiliar with it, it gives unlimited access during the uh, during the academic quarters um, to ride both this, the Chicago Transit Authority, the CTA buses and trains. Um, I have something similar through just um, the university um, as a staff member. It's great um, being able to ride unlimited and not to worry about having to put money back on, you know, recharge my card. It's just, it's a really great benefit. And, and I think that I use it so much more, like obviously because it's uh, for you during the academic year, like what I have, um, you know, using it nights and weekends. So it doesn't have to be used exclusively to get to campus. You can use it anytime um, during the, during the academic year. And then uh, the Chicago health insurance. So the University of Chicago does require all students to have health insurance. There is a university health insurance program, and that's the cost, but you don't have to use the university's um, health insurance. So if you have health insurance through other means, um, from parents, from a spouse, from a job, from from some from you you have your own independently, so you don't have to use the universities. But if you do, that would be the yearly cost for the four quarters. And then some other expenses to consider, you know, room and board. Um, maybe you already live here in Chicago, um, so you're not relocating. Maybe you're already established here, but if you're moving to Chicago, you 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 know you're wanting to think about what the cost of living here in the city is. Thinking about books, um, academic supplies, and then your personal supplies. Um, definitely always encourage students to think about, you know, to consider building budgets. I know that um, I never did. I never built a budget for myself. I probably should have. I probably would have helped me out a little bit. But definitely just throw that out there. Um, you know, think about your budget. Um, you know, no matter what graduate program you do, um, you know, there's a, there's a cost to it. Um, and even if you're not a program, those other expenses to consider, those are those are your sort of cost of living expenses, right? So those may or may not change, but definitely things to consider as you embark on a, a graduate program. And then we'll talk a little bit about financial assistance. So we do, um, we do provide some assistance to our students. Um, so we have our scholarships that are applied directly towards tuition. Um, that's what I referenced when you receive your admission letter, you'll also know about scholarships. So that is all done at the time of admission. Um, altogether, we, we award about $4 million um, towards tuition for students. And about 97% of our students are going to receive some sort of scholarship award. Um, and, and that's for both our domestic and international students. Um, for students who, you know, our, our financial assistance is likely not to not going to cover the full cost of attendance. They're, they're really partial scholarships. So a lot of our students will use um, federal student loans to, to supplement the cost. 
Um, I always encourage students to submit the FAFSA as soon as you can. Um, typically, I would recommend submitting it with your application. Now, right now, the government is um, doing some revisions to the FAFSA. Um, I heard that uh, or read that uh, the FAFSA application for next year is or this coming academic year is supposed to be available on December 1st. Um, so there's still a couple weeks. Um, hopefully they'll be on time. But so in December, um, if you are applying to the program, I definitely recommend um, submitting your FAFSA. And what the benefit of that is, uh, submitting the FAFSA early rather than later, is that if you uh, receive admission and then you are applying to federal loans, they'll be able to, our federal, our sorry, our graduate financial aid office will be able to match your FAFSA to your student record more quickly. And then you will know sooner than later um, what your eligibility for, for uh, uh, loans are. Um, we also recently did a, uh, a financial assistance um, webinar, and so it's posted on our YouTube site. So there's a lot more about loans and about financial assistance um, offered by the university. So if you want to go back and listen to that, you can definitely hear um, me talking a, a bit more about all the different um, sort of resources and how to think about financing your education. Um, some students might look for outside scholarships. So one of the things, if you listen to that webinar, you might hear me say is, you know, coming into social work, you're thinking about advocacy, advocate, advocating for others. Well, advocacy also starts with you, you know, so don't forget to advocate for yourself. So I always encourage students to start looking now for outside scholarships, do some Google searches, look for um, social work scholarships, look for social justice oriented scholarships, maybe thinking about your own personal identities. Um, are there any scholarships out there based on those um, that you might apply for uh, to help supplement the cost? Um, for those um, who are FAFSA eligible, uh, again, domestic students, um, you might be eligible for work study, and that could open up potentially some um, hourly pay work study positions within the university. Um, our student workers, for example, hourly pay rate for those um, we hire students with work study to help supplement the, uh, the cost. Um, I had mentioned research assistantships earlier. Um, so they also um, come their hourly pay, so they're not a stipend, but it's hourly pay. Um, some are, some require work study, but not all. Um, so there could be opportunities out there. Uh, typically research assistantships, as I mentioned earlier, tend to be, um, sort of announced later as the summer goes on. So you may not see them during the summer start, um, but certainly you might find opportunities coming into autumn. Um, outside of the federal loans, uh, some students might look for personal loans. Um, potentially, there could be some university-wide um, fellowships that might include a stipend. Uh, and again, those typically are announced a little later in the summer. Okay. So as we close out, you know, why might you choose Crown? Um, and here are a couple um couple elements. So uh, Aliyah, our uh, assistant director of admissions who couldn't be with us today, um, she's like, these are her personal favorites. And they certainly sort of match with some of the things that I really like about the program as well. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, you know, thinking again, that our faculty are bringing all sorts of um, knowledge and lenses and framing into the classroom. So you're really thinking really broadly about what it means to do this field of social work and, and all the different um, social, you know, social sector realms, right? Uh, social services realms. Um, the global perspective. So although for advanced standing students, because of the shortness of the program, you don't have an opportunity to do sort of an in international field placement. However, if you are interested in sort of global perspectives, we do have a number of classes that um, you would be able to take um, that really sort of explore, you know, how do some of these factors that we think about domestically, how do they play out in international contexts? Um, issues like urbanization, globalization, uh, technology, uh, the impact of them upon populations, how do they play out? And so there's opportunity there. Um, lifelong learning and connections. So Again, it's not simply a one-year experience with all that means. You know, we talked about the academic, we talked about the experiential field, we talked about all the programming. You are also joining, would be joining an alumni network. And so there are opportunities for professional um, development, you know, post-admission. Um, there are opportunities to connect with other alumni. Um, you know, that networking opportunity, our alumni are throughout the country. So we have a very vast network of, of alumni. And so if you choose to sort of 
remain engaged with Crown. There are so many more opportunities, um, invitations to speakers or paneling events um, that are available to you. Um, and then community engagement. Um, again, it, it sort of all ties together. Um, we are conscious that we, you know, as an institution, we're a predominantly white institution, historically white institution, and we are surrounded by community of color, communities of color here on the south side of Chicago. Um, and we are always thinking about how, when we talk about partnering with populations, we are always thinking about what is it that we have, this research and data that I mentioned really early on and at the beginning of the presentation, what's the research and the data that we have that we can help provide organizations, populations, you know, throughout Chicago, but really here on the South Side to sort of engage, how do, how do we think about how we're partnering them? You know, being conscious that, you know, we can bring all this information, we can bring this data, but also knowing at the end of the day, we're leaving those communities, right? And so what is it that we're doing? What are we leaving behind? What's our footprint? But how are we how are we doing our best again to sort of affect positive change within communities? Um, I can see the little number on my chat box here sort of increasing. Um, are there any, so I know we're coming up to the end, but so maybe we'll just say, well, let me just finish up here. Here's our contact information. So again, here's mine. Um, Aliyah, as I mentioned, uh, wasn't able to be here today. Jamal is here, as is Emma. And so here are the ways in which you can reach out to us and connect with us. We also have opportunities. If you go to our website, you can see um, there are opportunities for you to connect with um, some of our current students to talk about what their experience is, um, how, what, what, how they're experiencing the classes or their field placement process, what it was like to maybe move to Chicago, what it means to live in Chicago, um, how they're getting along. Um, a common question too comes up, do students work part-time? Yes, that's a very common question. That's a, I might have mentioned that previously in the uh, other slide about financing your education. Definitely a lot of our students, in addition to maybe finding campus jobs, a lot of our students will also work um, off campus in, in part-time positions. Okay, um, but, but again, um, our students are available to have those conversations. And so here we are at the end. So thank you all for attending and um, let's go to questions. Um, so I'll start with uh, our team. Are there questions out there that maybe I can answer now? Um, <clears throat> I think there's one application requirement that you maybe can sort of clarify. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of folks asked about um, is letter of recommendation required from a field liaison or a field supervisor uh, who can speak to their performance and their field placement. That would yes, that I, um, Mel, Melissa, I, I don't know that we ever say that it's required. Um, but it's certainly really helpful. We also know that sometimes field placements can happen late in the student's academic undergraduate experience. And so we definitely know with some institutions, like they just simply don't have a field, a letter from a field supervisor. Um, but if you're able to get one, that would be a fantastic opportunity um, or a fantastic letter recommendation to receive. Um. And then Rachel asked, if I haven't been able to reach my field liaison at the university who is responsible for our placement course, may I select another academic reference? Um, Going to go ahead and say yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think that we're aware, you know, there are always sort of like contextual limitations to who you can ask and who you can get letters from, knowing that there could be a really great person you want to ask for, but they're just simply not available to provide that letter, you know, and you just, you know, you you go with who you have. And what's really nice about our process is it's, it's really a holistic review. So there's not one sort of like area that's going to say like, Nope, you're done, right? So, so we are thinking about the candidate statement. We are taking a look at your experiences outlined on your resume. We're looking at um, the letters of recommendation to sort of supplement what you're saying about what your goals are. You know, so someone who's able to speak again to either your academic or research experiences. Um, so it's really just everything is sort of taken into consideration. Um, like I say, there's not one piece um, that is going to cause your application to be sort of outright, you know, uh, you know, up or down. You know, you, you know, there's there's a whole sort of sense of understanding about the whole sort of applicant mm -hmm. as we're doing the review process. Um, 
Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, you know, feel free to come off mute. Uh, you can definitely post them now. Hi, um, my name is Sierra Carter. I was just wanting to ask, do you all have a um, Ronald E. McNair program at your institution? Kristen, do we have a McNair program? So we used to have a McNair program, but they sunset the program and now there's other research programs. I put a link um, in the in the chat to where you can see the listing of the current summer research programs we have. So a similar focus and mission, but not the McNair's program. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. Ah, commuter students. Um... Yes, definitely. I certainly know that students absolutely commute to school from the suburbs. Um, we have students who live all over. We've had students who lived in Indiana who have commuted um, from Indiana. So um, from all over. Absolutely. Now, right you're... now we oh, yeah, Sorry, right now we have a student that um, commutes from Waukegan, Illinois. Oh, which oh is my so God. Far, and we were even able to find a placement out there for them. So that way on field placement days, they are you know, in their town, and then they just come to Crown um, for classes, so yeah. Yes, so yeah, all over. I have another question. Um, so I know you mentioned something about uh, like grad assistantships, and so for someone who um like for myself I was already an undergrad like would that also be a possibility if um if I do that to like you know take care of housing and stuff absolutely uh, we have had students they call them resident heads here a little bit different um than the RA role but yes there are housing related roles um that current students masters and PhD students um and faculty and staff you know actually can hold um there's also graduate assistantships in different offices across campus particularly a lot of our student affairs and campus and student life offices they will have grad assistantships as well that will have a stipend and or you know potentially tuition support depending on the office um but yes those opportunities for sure exist Thank you. Mm -hmm. Saw this question pop up. Is doing research a big part of the experience or is it more so opt-in? Um, well, it's not opt-in for any research that's happening in the classroom experience, all right? Um, but as far as like external, like outside of the classroom, then that would be sort of more an opt-in, like no one's going to be required to do like a research project, like that's not part of the requirements. Um, like I say, I, I think that there's there's so many opportunities, um, you don't have to participate, um, but you may find yourself simply wanting to. end of the year project um no we it do kind of be, yeah i was gonna say not not for the entire program however if you're a part of perhaps one of our specialized certificates or or something like that we've got some different pathways where students might have for instance our kip Hart, um global um and social development certificate the students do an end of the program capstone so somewhat like a project so it's very specific to um to maybe a, a certificate that you might be in but nothing for the whole whole degree program. Yeah. Uh, Krista, maybe you can take this one too. How would you describe the student community culture at Crown? Ooh, student community culture. That's a great question. Um, I'd certainly say one, I think we're very relational, um, very kind of, um, I think community oriented. Um, you Chicago also, I think Alyssa is a student who is, you know, also in some ways, um, really passionate about the work that you're doing. Our students really, I think, 
you know, get into deep discussions, deep dialogues about the work, about things happening in society, things that are affecting the systems that we're working in. So our students are really passionate um, and they're also really fun. Our students like to do fun things. We've had outings. Um, we do tours. We're talking about having a, you know, Crown's Got Talent, talent show. So I think we like to have fun, but we're also passionate and serious. And then we really do care about each other. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say those are all key, key pillars of the um, student um, student culture. I also say one thing that you know is challenging is our students are also pretty um, pretty busy, um, pretty you know perhaps um, just got their hand in multiple different things. So our students are pretty ambitious, um, but also yeah, very busy. <laughs> yeah, I think you know graduate programs can be so interesting um, in that they they can really change year to year. Um, they can really rise and fall on the personalities of your colleagues, your, your student peers. Um, what's really nice about Crown, I, I sort of referenced this when I was talking about my own experience, is that, you know, Crown has all these sort of like built-in programs that are really there to sort of help foster community engagement and community sort of with students. Um, and, and so in programs that don't have that, and you're really relying on your, your fellow students to create a culture on your own, um, that can sometimes be really challenging. For some people, it's super, super easy. For people who are really extroverted, um, for people who are really engaged, it can be super easy. Um, for other folks, maybe it's a little more challenging, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity here in Crown to participate and to be part of the culture. Yeah. Uh, again, no one's obligated to do that, um, but I think that all this sort of, um, the opportunities are there to, to have that experience if you want it. I saw a question about the school social work program. I can answer that. So yes, um, after you're accepted into the general program, then any student who might be interested in the school social work program, there's a, a separate um, application process that happens in the winter quarter of your first year. So after students have had some time, some folks also aren't sure they're interested in school social work until they get here. So it's good that we you know, give students a little bit of time before they decide that they want to do that program. Yeah. And the staff, um, the staff member who sort of helps oversee the school social work program, Jenny Mead, she is a fantastic resource and she was always very, very excited um, to hear from uh, prospective students and to talk about the program and to sort of like, you know, hear what your interests are, uh, encourage students to apply. Um, so she's she's very engaged with the student population. So I think we could, uh, I don't know, Jamal or Emma, if you're able to put Jenny's email address, or if you prefer to reach out to one of us so we can sort of facilitate an introduction, also happy to do that. But really, Jenny's the type of person you can email directly independently and just say, I'm interested in Crown. I'm interested in events standing. I'm interested in doing the school social work program. Can we meet? Can we connect? And she'll be more than happy to sort of have that, you know, to, to connect with you and to have that conversation and share about the program. Yeah. Thanks, Emma and Jamal. Just beat me to everything today. <laughs> you beat me on a couple of links. <laughs> it's a race. Yeah. They're on campus housing for grad students. Good question. I know, Jamal, you just you put the, the housing guide um, in there. So it's not necessarily on campus housing per se, but there our our university is mostly graduate students. So even the housing that's around the campus, it's pretty much mostly students and graduate students. Um, so um so our students I think haven't found any trouble, um, had any trouble finding a place, um, a reasonably, you know, reasonable price um, around campus but the housing guide will be your best bet um, where you can find good options. That's a great question. If uh, if one were to get accepted and the financial award isn't what we can afford, is there anyone we could talk to? Absolutely, it would be me. Um, but definitely, we uh, absolutely encourage students, like if the if the financial aid award, the, the tuition scholarship that they're offering um, is not sufficient, um, we actually do have a, a form that will uh, encourage students to submit, uh, kind of helps us track all the requests. Um, it gives you an opportunity to to sort of like provide a little bit more uh, explanation if you want as to, you know, how it's insufficient or uh, give you an opportunity to say like how much more you might need. Um, again, we don't typically offer full awards, um, typically, um, but we will try to, you know, do our best to to give some additional funds um, to, to help make attending Crown much more feasible for you. 
And, and, you know, if, if you ask once and we give you money and it's still not sufficient, we're always open to receiving a second request and to having that conversation. So, so it's not, oh, it's not necessarily a one and done. Oh, I see we are now just after five o'clock. Um, so certainly we can linger on for a few more minutes, but officially this will close our session. So thank you all for attending. Again, this was our first, uh, our inaugural uh, webinar specifically for advanced standing students. So I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. Really excited that you're interested in the program and really hoping that we see your applications. Um, if you have any sort of questions, absolutely feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll also post this recording on our YouTube site. So if there's something that you want to come back to, um, it will be posted online. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.